Okay, we're going to continue our uh, afternoon session. This is live case and lecture two in Complex Tavern. Um, I'm Alan Young and Moon Ki Hong um, back on the, on the as moderators, and we have panelists uh, Paul uh, Chaim, uh, Sun Yuk Choi, uh, Byung Hee Huang, Wang Jiang Kim, uh, Chen Chi uh, Simon Simon Lam, and also Xu Wang Yu. So the first case is coming from uh, John Hunter Hospital, uh, Australia. Um, my friend um, Rohan Bagwadian and also Andrew Boy will be uh, doing the first case. Uh, Rohan, can you hear us? Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Bye, Hi, everybody. John Hello from Australia, uh, Newcastle, John Hunter Hospital. I'm Roan Bagwin Dean, and I'm here with my, my friend, colleague, and uh, partner in crime, Andrew Boyle. Uh, we've got a crack team today, which I'd like to introduce uh, Brooke Keeble, our TAVI coordinator. We've got um, Carolyn, Jacob, um, Carla, and Carissa. I've got Ben Piper, my colleague, uh, cardiac and he's doing uh, cardiac anesthesia for us today, and, and Jeremy backing him up as well. Um, I'd like to just uh, invite Brooke Keeble, our coordinator, to uh, present today's case. Great. Brooke, Go over ahead. to you. Go ahead. Yep. Thanks, Rowan. Next slide, please. The live case we're presenting today from the John Hunter Hospital is a 78-year-old gentleman that's presented with early primary bioprosthetic failure of a trifecta 25mm valve with severe aortic regurgitation, which was surgically implanted in 2021. He's been referred with increasing shortness of breath on minimal exertion and occasional presyncope. His past medical history includes hypertension, dyslipidemia, some airways disease, and he's living currently independently with his wife. Next slide, please. His cardiac evaluation shows a transthoracic echo with severe aortic regurgitation and a dilated LV with a depressed ejection fraction of 45%. His transesophageal echo showed severe central AR with no paravalvular leaks. His cardiac uh, angiography showed minor non-obstructive coronary artery disease with an elevated EDP. Next slide, please. His CT analysis confirmed a 25 millimetre trifecta valve with a true internal diameter of 23 millimetres. He's got copacious sinuses with adequate VTC distances. Next slide, please. His STJ and LVOT is clear, with clean, with uh, adequate femoral anatomy for a transfemoral approach. Next slide, please. So in summary, we've got a primary valve failure with a 25 millimetre trifecta valve with a severe aortic regurgitation, and it's non-frackable. He's got capacious sinuses with adequate VTC distances. His STJ and LVOT is non-hostile, and his peripherals are suitable for a transfemoral approach. He's got a dilated LV with mild LV dysfunction. The heart team consensus was to proceed with a transcatheter aortic valve implantation, valve in valve. Great. Great, thank you, uh, Great, Rohan. Uh, maybe we open up for the panel to uh, discuss how they will approach this a little bit, and um, and then we can obviously hear your your expert uh, opinions. So, what would people do? This trifecta valve is one of those valves that are, have been noticed to have very, a very early failure, um, and obviously that's what's happening here. Only a few years out from his surgery, right? And usually, modality failure is that the leaflet, you know, basically, I'm, I shouldn't say broke, but yeah, essentially broke. lead to quite tremendous aortic regurgitation. Was his original valve pathology aortic regurgitation as well, or AS? Uh, I, I don't recall your presentation. It was aortic regurgitation. Okay. 
So his ventricle may be a little dilated already before and now obviously much under much load from the new from the failure of the trifecta. Okay. So what do panelists think? What should we? This is a, another surgery patient. Um, you know, repeat operation um, second time within a few years or Taber. What What do you think, Paul or Simon? No. Yes, for this patient, thank you. So this patient, a 78-year-old with poor LVEF and also with open surgical um, procedure before, so my number one choice would be WAF in WAF TAVI. But uh, taking into account that trifecta is some of the WAF that we have specific concern um, for uh, coronary obstructions and uh, so CT would be very important to look at the surrounding, surrounding area, um, surrounding region where there, there are problems. And I would specifically look at uh, the echo to see the, what are the etiology of the AR, whether there's torn leaflets or any other thing. So before planning for a procedure, I would specifically look at those. And for valve choices, maybe, uh, I think different valves could, could help the patient, but if size is allowed at surrounding environment, well, we a perennial valve may give better hemodynamics, but we need a more... Uh, like to so see more clearly the echo and the CT for the surrounding structures. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I think a valve in valve is a great choice. Um, for this internal diameter 23, I think there will be not too much difference whether you choose a self-expanding or balloon expandable valve. I think the gradient will be okay. But I think it will be a good choice for this patient and definitely my first choice. I think the VTCs are okay. I wouldn't be too worried about the coronary occlusion part. Right, so the, uh, as, as everybody knows, trifecta, the leaf is on the outside of the frame, and, and the, you know, it's not fracturable. Um, it's built such a way that you know, the frame is, cannot be broken. Um, and also 25 is a 23, essentially, um, in, inside, so we can't really make much more than that. So, would people generally use um, self-expanding here? Who wants to put a self-expanding? Anybody want to raise their hand to put self-expanding? Self yeah. Hmm? Internal diameter 23 millimeters. So yeah. uh, I, I think that the uh, supraannular self expandable valve more uh, uh, better than the uh, balloon expandable valve, I think. Wenki, would you use the self expanding? Yes, of course. I am. So maybe half half here, uh, Rohan. Half people say no difference, uh, low profile valve already, might as well put a you know, low profile system in and deal with it down the road that you have a choice of a self-expanding uh, or go with a self-expanding to start. Um, no coronary disease, so should hopefully not. Um, so tell us your thoughts, what, what, which way you want to approach. Before, before I hand over to Andrew Allen, I just want to clarify that there were very capacious sinuses. The VTC was 5.5 on both sides and the, it's a left dominant system and the stent posts um, are sitting uh, below the left main coronary artery. Um, Andrew, what are we going to do today? Yeah, I think they're all great points. Um, because this is a larger valve, it's a 25 millimeter trifecta, we thought that a balloon expandable valve with an intraannular uh, valve position would give adequate radiance. It would be a quicker and cleaner procedure as well. Um, okay. So for that reason, we've chose to go with a um, balloon expandable valve. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I think, Alan, that when you're looking at um, internal diameters around 23 and above, there really is equipoise about which valve you can choose here. And so, we, you know, our aim today is to, to deliver it quickly, uh, effectively, and, uh, um, you know, at, at a correct height. So um, uh, that's our plan. But I'm interested to, to other thoughts from the... Yeah. So the one way we'll to tell for, uh, to sort of get some historical data while you start working is really looking at after surgery, was there any data of the gradient, right? So after the surgery, hopefully it was successful, and then, you know, you have a baseline gradient, and the baseline gradient is, is really sort of acceptable. Likelihood putting a, a, a balloon expandable valve there will still get about the same gradient. Your failure right now is AI, right? So you just need to get rid of that yep. AI and get back the surgical gradient that you had. But if the post up surgical gradient is 25, 30, or something like that, then tells you that that size may be not appropriate for him, the 25 uh, trifecta. So, so I think that would be some uh, uh, historical data may be helpful. Uh, but otherwise, I think, you know, proceed with uh, uh, your 23. We, we have a fair, fairly large geography here, and mm -hmm. this gentleman's from a regional, a regional area that, that we drain. Um, okay. He had his um, a valve a few years ago with, with, good, with good gradients, mm. and, and, and then emerged with severe symptomatic aortic regurgitation. And I think, I think Alan, you're right. We, we, in these cases, once the AR goes away, they just feel better immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's our plan today. Any difficulty in crossing uh, this valve? 
None whatsoever. No, right. You can pipe, pop, 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 pop through it through a, using a pigtail. They're much better than the aortic stenosis valve failures, aren't they? Yeah. We'd like to say it was very hard, Alan, but, but no. Okay. <laughs> so you're prepping your sapien valve. What size of the sapien? This is... Sorry, this is a 26 millimeter sapien. Yeah. And Actually, we've got the surgical valve size is a 25, and yeah, the, 25, the valve is a yeah. more bigger. Yeah. Is there any reason? Um, there, there's just a, from the app and just a measuring, uh, you know, the internal is 23, but the 20, 26 probably fits well on there because it's just a sort of internal yeah. diameter um, calculation. Um, yep. And sometimes the frame's a little indented from the panis and the old leaflets, um, but this is mainly aortic regurgitation, we're not expecting that, um, but we'll see right. after it's deployed how it looks. We've also gone for a general anaesthetic mm. um, in this case because of his uh, left ventricular dysfunction and to get the positioning just right. We've got a temporary transvenous pacemaker through the femoral vein. Uh, normally we'd pace over the wire in the LV, but with a dilated left ventricle like this, contact can sometimes be less than predictable. Yeah. So we thought we'd... Um, Go not for minimalist tablet today, but for a full general anaesthetic and transvenous pacing. I uh, agree completely because, you know, with putting a valve into a, a valve in valve, surgical valve, the valve is pretty slippery. And if you're anything that is missing a beat, you can certainly, that valve can move and you don't want that. So, so I think, um, you know, very controlled pacing and reliable pacing is crucial. So where would you put this uh, sapien dot, the, the marker on the sapien on this uh, trifecta valve? You have this ribbon and the bottom and then sort of a very light looking color of three, three uh, posts, right? Yeah, thanks Alan. So, so this is the view we have with the three posts and you can see the degree of aortic regurgitation obviously. And so one approach is to insert the valve in this position, lining up the top of the three posts. And the other alternative is to go in the cusp overlap view. Mm -hmm where there's two posts overlapping. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we choose to do today is go in the three post view and see how the valve aligns, see how the loosened line looks and make a decision as to whether we need to rotate around to the two cusp view. Okay. And then we'll position the valve frame just above, the top of the valve frame just above the top of the surgical valve posts. Mm -hmm. This patient is at the, valve uh, valve patient is at the, we saw the, the echocardiography image is a transesophageal echo image, is a usual pattern. Is there any other lesion the type of procedure with the, uh, is there a general anesthesia for this patient? Yeah, we've actually done this. It's not our typical practice. And so, um, so I must say we do this particularly when there's depressed left ventricular contractility. And uh, for example, for, like, yep or bicuspids uh, is when we would do that as well. Um, but generally we have a minimalist tabby sort of approach. That looks good. Um, we're just aligning, we're just across here and we're just going to get our pusher back and have a look and see what our alignment li is like with the lucent line. Um, and we'll just use a bit of motion with the wire as well just to see if we can straighten that up just a little bit. There's an expectation, Andrew, that this valve is gonna self-center. Exactly. Um, uh, and so, and this is our... It's more of the cusp overlap view. I think we'll go back to the three yeah, post view. Yeah, I, think. I, I don't think the cusp, I don't think it helps yeah, that much, Andrew. I, mean, I think yeah, it's hybrid in between views. Yeah, so that, 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 that looks pretty good. And so mm -hmm. let's just have a look and see where we are now. Um, so I'll push the wire in. So, okay, so why would you take a dry cine here? I'll put a bit more flex on. Would the panelists be doing this under local anesthesia? Uh, in a minimalist fashion as well, or would they uh, adopt the same approach we have? Uh, we generally would just do Mac in, in this situation. Um, would, would do a what, sorry? Uh, uh, just uh, um, um, monitor um, anesthesia care Mac, so just yeah. local and uh, somebody watching on the top, obviously. I guess the other issue is, would you be pacing over the wire, anybody, or would you use uh, the RV pacing? I think we're still pretty conservative for me and we just use the uh, transvenous pacing. We feel more comfortable to be more, especially you said big ventricle, you never know what happened to the wires, skip a few beats, um, could be pretty... Look, we, we always worry a bit about the refractoriness in these large LVs as well, Alan, and yeah. so, you know, if the LV function is down, we, we use the RV and 
Um, and sometimes it's a biventricular feature as well. So, you know, we'll be checking our pacing shortly and uh, yeah. be interested in your opinions. Yeah. I think I'll like be checking with the pacemaker. Your patient balloon is up, so I don't know whether you like the balloon up or not in your RV pacing. Uh, I we usually, actually do that. We, we do then? that okay. um, as a routine. Mm. And um, we, we've had, um, we, with the old system, that we've had one, everyone has one RV perforation mm -hmm. uh, and, then move, moves, one. and moves to this system and never deflates the balloon. Okay. Uh, do you deflate your balloon? Yeah, I feel it has better contact to give me better pacing. But, you know, if you are comfortable and you, if you get captured, I have no problem with that. Well, we're going to have a look now yeah, and we'll, uh, see, how we we'll go. see how we go. Ready, pacing at uh, 200? 200. Okay, pacing on. Pacing on. This is not pacing at 200 yet. There we now go. it goes. Yep, okay. Pacing off. That's good. That looks pretty good to me. Yeah. I, think we'll, I think we'll be happy there. Yeah. And we've also got the benefit of turning the lungs off as well. Okay. Because uh, we're under GA. Yeah. Let's just see if we're happy with this position. It's moving around a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Are you happy with that? Uh, is everyone on the panel happy with that position? Any, any comments on how they'd like to position this? What should we do differently? A bit higher. I think, uh, yeah, you, you just said it. I, I would say that go a little bit higher. Yeah. I think we're going to have to do this under pacing. Yeah. Um, ready for lungs just off, also, pacing yeah. on. Pacing on. Pacing on 200. Pacing off, lungs back on. So that looks a little bit too ventricular for my liking. Yeah. I think we'll probably have to come back a couple of millimeters. What do you think on the panel? I think so. Uh, and I think the pacing helps that it, it, it doesn't move. So at least you know that once you're in a position, you pace at 200, Correct. it seems to freeze it, right? So, so that's helpful. Yeah, so if we get the pacing on, I'll just adjust it. And you, then tell me, you tell me when it goes. All right. Okay, you guys go. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm happy about there. Okay, lungs off, pacing on. Pacing on 200. I'm happy there. Go there. Mm. Perfect. Yeah. Pacing off, lungs on. Good. So you can much. see the frame's a bit constrained there. Yeah. So that was a nominal fill, and I left about 0.5 behind because of the constraint, mm -hmm. um, and uh, which, we, which we often see in, in, in cases like this. We just feel it out as we go. And um, so that looks pretty good. I'm, I'm pretty happy, yeah, pretty with, happy with the Emos, and I think yeah. his, his ventricle is going to be pretty happy mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. I think the position is great that if you need to sort of, uh, let's say, use a balloon to sort of push it up a little bit, not fracturing, but push it up a little bit, you can, you can because you, you, it won't yeah. rise too much, right? So you can check radiant, yeah. check all that stuff. If you feel comfortable, happy, then you can always stop. Yeah, so, so we're going we're gonna to get on and do that now. And we'll Let's just take the flex off here and... Uh, flex is up. So flex is, no, full. That's full. I like your pacing at higher rates. Uh, it really freezes the, the valve uh, better than 160, 180 type of things. And Look, I think we, these... We found every once in a while, Alan, as I'm sure you have as well, is that when you get the occasional ectopic or loss of capture, um, it tends to, to, to move around a little bit more at those lower rates. And uh, yeah. we arrived on the higher uh, rates really with L over the wire LV pacing. Because, mm. you know, we really were really paranoid and really wanted to get it absolutely right. Isn't that right, Andrew? Yeah. yeah. So that's when we went to these higher rates. And Makes it sense. seems to be holding in as well. Yeah. yeah. And as you mentioned, these valve in valves, they can be quite slippery. Um, right. So I think you get all, all, everything you can on your side in these type of cases. I mean, you'd have to treat it like, as if like it is aortic regurgitation in native valve, right? Because kind of slippery, kind of right, moving around. Right. So you don't want to be missing it. And then the next thing is, you know, it's out in the a uh, ascending aorta, for example. Exactly. So, so I think here, uh, you know, high rates pacing, venous side pacing, slightly maybe, you know, I think you are perfect in terms of location. So you bring the marker up a little bit to make sure that it is not too deep, but at the same time, not too high, right? So we don't want to have it sitting on zero position, for example. So I'll just show just, you our hemodynamics. Yep. And yep. Uh, so look, you know, we've got a, 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 no. grad, a gradient of two, which, mm -hmm. which we're pretty comfortable with, yeah. uh, which, which we're pretty happy with. And there's, Andrew, do you want to talk good, through the Good diastolic separation. If you remember at the beginning of the case, yeah. the aortic and ventricular diastolic pressures were equal. Yeah. Um, which is not a good place to be. So I think he'll feel immediate relief from this. 
Yeah. And I'm pretty happy that although the valve frame is a little constrained in the middle, that we've got a perfect hemodynamic results, and I don't think we need to post dilate this. What do you think, Rowan? Look, I, look, I agree. Um, I'm really interested in what the panel does think. I mean, uh, I know there's some data recently out of Vancouver's group uh, looking at post dilating routinely um, with uh, safe in valve and valve and in non frackable valves and whether or not it makes a difference. Um, we traditionally have, haven't done it unless we have a gradient, um, and, I, and I don't think there's a downside. The only thing I can think about is uh, potentially halt, and I don't think that's an issue here. Alan, does the panel have any views on this? What do people think? Um, are they comfortable with that uh, slightly sort of hourglass uh, valve? There's a reason that it looks like that, because obviously, as Munki was talking about, the internal diameter is 23. You're putting in mm -hmm. a 26. You're not going to be looking straight, <laughs> unless you can somehow fracture this non-fracturable valve, which therefore is hopeless. So I think pretty much this will, even if you go up in size or whatever you're going to do, I think you'll look the same. So, so I think with that gradient, um, I'm very happy to call it, you know, a success. And um, unless you have some aortic regurgitation in some situations, for example, what if we'll the surgical we'll leaves, we'll show yeah. you some toe images. Right. And, so this uh, is real-time transesophageal echo. Right. So in, in some surgical record. valves, it is uh, calcified and AI at the same time. Sometimes you might have a little space there and you want to smush, uh, smooth it up. I can only see that the reason to post dilate. Here, gradient is not an issue. And I think there's no AI. No parabolic yeah, bleed. I'm happy with that. There just seems to be a little wire, wire artifact, of course. And, yeah. um, and, and, and I guess, Alan, in your lab, what would push you, in this case, would you, would you post dilate? And if you did, what, what size balloon would you use? We, yeah. uh, we were debating this before the case. Yep. We got a true balloon and we were just debating what size we were going to use. Well, what would you do? Yeah, so if there is some perivalvular leak, um, uh, I would probably pose that with a true balloon. And the true balloon, I thought they have a 24. So um, I might be wrong, uh, but I would not go to 20, 25 because it, the, the internal diameter is 23. So you can plus one, so 24. Um, so give it a little squeeze there. But here, I wouldn't because I think you have a great gradient and you have no leak. So there's no point in damaging or you know, traumatizing the uh, tab of leaflets. Yeah. Any thoughts? Would anybody? anyone routinely post dilate these valve in valves on the panel? So for, uh, sorry. For us in, in Hong Kong, for example, all the trifecta we see is 19 and 21. To start off with, they are very have a gradient. So we tried our best to optimize the hemodynamics for those. It's, for example, 19, the inner diameter is just 17. For trifecta 21, it would be just 19. Uh, this is yeah. non-fracturable valve. Well, we don't want to use a very strong balloon. So don't, we don't want to have a, a balloon that can fracture everything or to act against something that is not breakable. So we try to add some volume into the delivery system, just try to flare on both sides. This is what we could do for a trifactor. But uh, I, um, I don't need to do the routine, but I think measuring gradient uh, to make a decision afterwards is the most appropriate thing to do. No, no routine post dilation, because also the leaflet dysfunction concerns after high pressure um, inflation of balloons. Yeah, Alan, yeah. can it? Out here. Oh, yeah. yeah, I, I just would, I think I would echo what uh, Simon has, has just said. It's, I mean, these, this is a case of AI, and I think with AI, gradients just not the issue or anything like that. But if it was AS, you know, these these trifecta valves are not fracturable, as everybody has noted, but they are bendable, um, and the post will bend. We call it bio, you know, bioprosthetic valve remodeling (BVR). Um, if you if you like that, and we would, you know, if we, if this was for AS, we would do that fairly routinely. We would treat it with a self-expanding valve, and we would generally. Um, mold the leaflets um, uh, afterwards. So what size would you use uh, internal for 25 is 23? Is We'd probably use, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd probably use a 26. I mean, you've already done a 26 here, of course. Um, so I don't think that's, you know, this would be more for if you're using a self-expanding. But I'd use a 26. We'd keep, you know, again, if it was self-expanding, we would keep it low. And the idea is just, you know, and we, I wouldn't use a true balloon. I would just use a Z-Med or something like that. Just to, fl again, just to flare the posts enough. And usually you get, you know, you don't get the kind of gradient reduction that you do with a true fracture, but you do get some gradient reduction, so um, we believe in it. Yeah, for us, I think semi-compliant balloon works better than a non-compliant balloon for flaring. Okay. What, what, what is the, the cause of the, the early uh, valve failure, surgical valve, valve failure in this patient? The reason why we deploy the, the additional the uh, uh, sapien valve, is there any possibility of the early the uh, failure, in, even though we did it, 
So if there is a, some the, uh, imaging specialist, uh, you deploy it in the 26 uh, sapien valve, but the, considering the underlying surgical valve, the valve co-optation is uh, quite enough. In hemodynamically and uh, the procedural, uh, the result is uh, perfect. I agree, but the co-optation of the valve maybe not uh, sufficiently expanded. Maybe there is a, the, some chance of the uh, second episode of the early uh, failure of this patient. So I, oh, yep. I asked my surgeon many times why many times why the trifecta fails, and they all they couldn't give me a straight answer. They just say that's a bad valve. So I, I don't know what that means. So so. So I think there's something wrong with the trifecta, meaning outside, per, outside is you know, supposed to be, give you a better area, but somehow the leaflets are disintegrate in a short time. So I think something wrong with the preservation technique or this leaflets. So all trifecta has to be watched because they basically just fall apart like this. And um, it's, it's, it's now, Alan, I think that we, um, we have a bit of a legacy of trifecta in our area because mm. it was a favorite valve. Um, and we've seen a few of these patients come back and they come back early. Right. And certainly, I, I'm, I wouldn't presume to, to, to know all of the surgical mechanisms, but there, there certainly is early, fa early failure, which was recognized fairly, fairly soon. And I'm, I'm also aware that I think, I think in the US, the FDA has done a recall. Yeah. So, um, with, so, but from our perspective, again, and just from a, from, I know he's 79 and he's a smoker, but from a lifetime planning perspective, one of the other reasons that we've, we've gone with, with, the, um, with the Sapien Ultra is that he's got capacious sinuses, we're below the coronaries. Um, you know, if, um, for example, he does have failure of this valve, well, then we have an opportunity to put another one in uh, fairly comfortably and effectively. But I'm, I'm quite interested in the thoughts on the panel about this. It's a, it's a very hot topic at the moment, Andrew, isn't it? Lifetime planning. Um, and it was a great question, what's the mechanism of failure? You could see the transesophageal echo, there was no leaflet avulsion. Yeah. So that wasn't a risk. Um, it's some sort of leaflet failure, and is it a patient factor, is it a valve factor? I agree, Alan, it's probably valve, but will this valve fail too? That's a great question. So that's another reason to choose the balloon expandable. We can always go inside that with a self-expanding valve in five years' time if this and, fails. And he doesn't have chronic renal failure. He doesn't have all the other things we normally see with these early failures. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to we'll get out of take a punt and say it's probably related you to the trifecta to itself. No color. No, yeah, I um, think, I think your, this valve will last, you know, the normal time frame for a, tavern, a sapien tavern valve. So, you know, next valve you put in, if indeed, you know, hopefully 10 years later, it's, you know, you can put in a self-expanding at that time, given that coronary disease, if it's stable without problem. So to address that question, we're just looking at the valve leaflets on the transesophageal echo, if you can see that. Yeah, we can. And they look pretty good. Uh, a bit hard to tell. Obviously. I know the previous speaker was relating to pinwheeling and, and those sort of issues. And, and look, and I think it's always something that we do think about as well. But I must say, we're pretty happy with this. And Alan, you were talking about this valve longevity. So we were aiming for about 20 years. We think that'll be about right. <laughs> yeah. Great. All right. Well, well, uh, Rohan and, and, and Andrew, both very good case. Uh, you know, love to see you know valve in surgical valve uh, type of procedure because that you know help us really think through that these really questions of lifetime that. management and, and and so forth. So great case. Uh, thanks to your team for being so cooperative. Uh, and you know, have a great day in in Newcastle. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you for having right. us. Thank you for having us. Okay, uh, we will move the, on the next uh, topic, which uh, the title of the presentation is a table for the uh, bicuspid valve. What is different? Uh, the speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Han, Chang Min An, Assam Medical Center. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Hong. I'm Chang Min An from Assam Medical Center. My topic is a bicuspid aortic valve table. Actually, uh, uh, the top of a tricuspid aortic valve is very standardized, so it could be a routine procedure in our cath lab practice, but uh, still, well, bicuspid aortic valve tower still have many debate issues. The, this, um, this year, the uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Cohen group uh, published some uh, document about the current consideration and future direction for clinical research in bicuspid aortic valve. They commented that uh, 
challenges associated with tabular impacts of aortic valve, knowledge gap, and clinical trials, etc., etc. This is a clinical and anatomical challenges for bicuspid with tabular. The clinical challenge would be the younger age, pro, uh, presence of concomitant arthropathy, more likely to present with predominantly AR. In addition, associated with our anatomical uh, challenging factors. This is another re uh, kind of review article is, uh, recently published that uh, this is a whole evidence on tower in bicuspid aortic valve stenosis. So look at the most uh, published data show that the very short term follow. The more than two years is very rare. The almost all cases, almost all published data is the follow up duration is only one year, less than one year. STS ACC TV registry show that the SAPEN3 evolute R regarding the hard end point mortality or stroke, there is no difference between the tricuspid valve tower and bicuspid Tower. I summarized the uh, uh, whole uh, data so far, show that uh, bet there is uh, no significant difference uh, between the bicuspid tower, tricuspid tower regarding the heart end point death and stroke, PPM major bleeding, but uh, significant PVL, <coughs> arterial root injury is significantly higher in bicuspid aortic valve tower. Uh, what is better that the tower versus tower in bicuspid AS? Still, the data is very limited. In hospital mortality, similar uh, long-term mortality, not long-term two-year mortality, there is no significant difference between the SAVA and TAVA in bicuspid AES. Which valve would be better? Uh, Self-expandable, bullying expandable. So far, there is no significant difference. In first-generation TAVA device, newer-generation TAVA device. But the complication rate is different. Annual rupture is higher in the balloon expandable device. Significant PVL is higher in self-expandable device. So what is the characteristic of bicuspid aortic valve disease? The most important thing is the younger bicuspid aortic valve disease is the severe AS in younger patient. The, this is a surgical aortic valve replacement auto, a case. The very older generation, more than 81, only 28% bicuspid aortic valve, but the younger population, less younger than seven years old, 60% of patient bicuspid aortic valve. Consid when you consider the top age between the 65 to 80, 80 in the based on the current US guideline, the 65 to 70 years old, bicuspid aortic valve would be the um, and around the 50% in the real world practice. Initially, the Chinese population showed that the higher rate of bicuspid aortic valve tower, but I think this is not due to the ethnicity, but due to the mean age of population. Chinese, China, Chinese population tower is around 74, younger than Western society tower population, so this is associated with younger tower age, not the ethnicity. Another important aspect of bicuspid aortic valve is a significant severe uh, aortic valve calcification. We analyzed the calcification volume between the bicuspid and tricuspid valve. Bicuspid valve has uh, the two times higher calcification volume in the aortic, around the aortic valve. Some calcification morphology associated with a higher rate of event. It, it, it is like very severe asymmetric calcification, rapid calcification, and VOT calcification. The check. Uh, yes, one, I can hear you. One. Well, uh, one paper Japanese showed that uh, the aortic valve calcification is associated with the uh, aortic root injury and higher PVL rate. So, bicuspid aortic valve is just frequently associated with arthropathy. So, but the uh, previous study showed that the risk of aortic dissection after uh, art, surgical aortic surgical AVR in patients with uh, bicuspid aortic valve, the risk is very low compared with uh, Marfan syndrome, the rate of aortic dilatation after surgical AVR, there is no significant difference re regarding the rate of aorta dilatation between bicuspid aortic valve and tricuspid aortic valve. Recently, the very famous uh, surg surgical group just demonstrated uh, nice demonstration that the uh, uh, aorta growth rate 
in bicostalgic valve and tricostalgic valve, they publish data that showed, suggest that the bicuspid autopathy does not require the earlier surgical intervention. So cutoff value could be the same with the tricuspid valve disease. They suggested the five centimeter of ascending aorta could be the cutoff value for the ascending aorta replacement in the at the time of aortic valve replacement. So I'd like to suggest that the high surgical risk population, TABO, without any consideration of ascending autopathy, but the low risk population, ascending aorta size is larger considering the plus surgical every, uh, aorta, replace, aorta surgery, but the ascending aorta size is smaller than five or, or 5.5 consider TAVR if indicated. So the most important indication, uh, consideration of the bicuspid TAVR is how to select the valve device sizing. This is important to, uh, paper, just they show that uh, compared with uh, which area is the most uh, smallest in the bicuspid artery valve complex. Uh, previously, we thought that um, supraannular component is the most smallest portion, but this study showed that the annulus or the annulus is the, in 88% of patients, the annulus is the most, uh, the smallest portion in the aortic valve complex in the bicuspid, severe bicuspid aortic valve disease patient. So for uh, balloon expandable device, I believe that uh, the annulus uh, depend, uh, annulus, annulus sizing is enough, but uh, don't do oversizing too much. Supraannular sizing would be applied for the self-expandable device. Actually, we need more sizing selection, the algorithm. From the, uh, since the introduction of SAPEN-3 in other medical centers, we predominantly implanted the SAPEN-3 in patient with bicuspid AES. Last year, we implanted 28, the SAPEN-3, uh, 27 SAPEN-3, uh, SAPEN I was implanted in the bicuspid AES, only one, the self-expandable device. So younger age, higher instance of bicuspid AES. So type type one is the most common bicuspid AES aortic valve type. This is the procedural characteristics. Free balloon valvular plastic is more frequently in patient with bicuspid AES. 125 patients so far underwent a tub with SAPEN-3 in bicuspid AES. Uh, Post-balloon is also more frequent. Uh, procedural death, no, patient, no procedural death, no conversion to surgery. PPA implantation is 6.4. PCC epicardial effusion is very rare. Coronary obstruction, nothing. Annular obstruction, nothing. But the segment PVL is 4%. After prospective match cohort, pre volume valvular plastic is more frequent in the bicuspid AES, but the other pre procedural complication outcome is similar between the tricuspid aortic valve and bicuspid aortic valve. This is a two year clinical outcomes, mortality and strong rate, no difference between the bicuspid and tricuspid aortic valve disease. So I think this is important how to make a size, select a size, depend on the Calcification volume, we measured every day, every, every day we measured aortic valve calcification. So very severe calcification, we reduce the volume. So don't oversize too much. Mostly nominal sizing, sometimes even undersizing. But the very rare aortic valve calcification, we apply the similar sizing algorithm to the tricuspid aortic valve. So if a patient have a, the bicuspid itself does not affect our the sizing mechanism, sizing algorithm, but the, how much the calcified aortic valve itself is affected our uh, uh, affected the, our selection algorithm of the S3 mm -hmm. the valve. So the, if we apply, when we apply the, this kind of algorithm, the, according to the calcification volume, complication rate is not different. So very severe calcification, look at this, type 0, type 1, very large severe calcification. We applied the device undersizing, volume underfilling, the very effectively and very safely 
we can treat the bicuspid aortic valve disease with a tower. So this is my conclusion. Bicuspid AES has a distinct clinical and phenotypical characteristics, younger age, more severe aortic valve calcification, and associated aortopathy. The incidence of parabellar leakage after the bicuspid tower is increased compared with the tricuspid uh, valve cohort undergoing tower. Caution should be exercised regarding the aortic root injury. Top of aortic valve uh, bicuspid AES is not associated with the excess risk of mortality and stroke. Subpen 3 implantation on bicuspid A aortic valve is not significantly different from subpen 3 implantation on tricuspid aortic valve, particularly if the bicuspid aortic valve doesn't have a severe calcification. However, there is a need to establish criteria for selecting patients with bicuspid aortic valve stenosis who can be successfully treated with a tower, similar to the echo score used for rheumatic MS. Thank you for your attention. Don, please stay here. Actually, uh, the live demonstration from the Australia does not take uh, much time. We have a uh, time for the uh, discussion about the Dr. An's presentation. Any comment or question? Dr. An, yeah. you, you recommended the, the surgery for patients with the uh, bicuspid AES and uh, concomitant uh, ascending aura, large ascending aura, above uh, 55 millimeter, right? You, you recommend the surgery. So I, 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 I have a question. If a patient has a high surgical risk and concomitant uh, larger uh, ascending aura, uh, above uh, 55 millimeter, how do you manage it, the patient? Uh, thank you very much. A very, a very important question. The, I, I, I was showing you the before that uh, if a patient has a high, high surgical risk, no doubt it, uh, just tower. But the low surgical risk, we have to consider the ascending outer size. Mm -hmm. Jenming, um, you focus on the calcium score, how much calcium in the... Do you also look at the distribution of the calcium and how do you use that? Yeah, uh, this is a very important question. Even though small the, uh, calcification located in the lafe or a chunk of calcium in the one side, it would be the uh, the I, I believe that it, it, it can increase the risk, but uh, even though I believe that the over calcification is more important than the location of calcification. Similar question to Alan. Uh, so, with some the worry about the some calcium score is problematic. In uh, we define the some default how, how would you some standardization of the house beauty unit depending on the manner. So that's why we really want to just like the mitral stenosis, we want to do calculate the criteria something. So the problem in you know, this one problem. The second one is I don't want to do some, usually the bicuspid aortic valve in a, uh, just follow the surgical zivert criteria. However, I really some strongly recommend this more CT guided, more especially the image guided is most better. So we move to the some next to some uh, not surgical criteria we are using by the some uh, tabby uh, tabby. Uh, so, so I, I don't want to some the, the terminology. So I don't want to change the some criteria of the bicuspid is near is nearly needed. I think. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Dr. An, I have a question and, and thank you for your excellent uh, uh, lecture. And I think in bicuspid valve, there are a lot of calcification. And so there are some studies uh, doing that, doing basilica in the bicuspid valve to make the valve leaflet to three leaflets. And there is some dedicated devices like shortcut and I think your personal opinion about doing these procedures to the bicuspid valve, making it trick speed, can it be the future or is it uh, maybe nothing good? Uh, thank you very much, very interesting question. So actually I'm not an expert in the basilica, something like that, but even though I believe that uh, uh, it, it depends on, uh, first of all, the, we have to, the first uh, critical question would be the, this patient to go for surgery or this patient to edit a suitable for tower. So we need a basilica, something like that, the further uh, procedure for safe tower procedure. Then 
I would like to consider the surgery first if a patient surgical risk is not that high. One last question. Do you always predilate by cuspid? No, not, not always. It depends on the mm -hmm. classification. Mm -hmm. And another, uh, my tip is that the movement of wire. So after insert the wire, the wire movement is very free, looks very free. Then most cases, we don't need to the uh, predilatation. But uh, sometimes uh, the classification is so se not so severe, but wire is looks like going looks like this not freely not, not moving. So then I, I'd like to do predilatation first. And um, lastly, I, I have a, a critical question. So when you are uh, balloon of the, your uh, balloon expandable belt, so what is the, your uh, specific uh, speed of balloon? Is different from the uh, biker speed and then uh, tricuspid belt. I'm just, uh, if the patient have a very severe uh, classification in the lape or some other heavy classification on the leaflet, maybe a very slow deflation is to prevent uh, another uh, uh, lobster risk uh, or some other uh, complication later. So, yeah, and, and thank you very much. It's, it's very, you, I think you mentioned very about the, the, just the asan, uh, asan, <laughs> asan speed or some other. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the uh, operator's preference. So the, I believe that the, the pre-planning pre determines everything. So, inflation speed may affect the patient outcome, but uh, each portion would be not that high. So, the selection, precision modification, such a, the planning before procedure is more important than uh, the procedure during the inflation, something like that. I have uh, the uh, more specified and the specific patient. Patient age is uh, 74. So maybe that is uh, the uh, indication for the tower. The type of uh, uh, bicuspid type 0 and the heavy calcification, fluoroscopy, and then now his impression is uh, too much heavy calcification. And uh, the ascending aorta size is uh, 49 just below the 50 <laughs> and uh, what is the, the uh, recommendation surgery or the tower <laughs> thank you very much so uh, nowadays my personal uh, recommendation in relatively young population age between the the 70 or the 75 the I, i'd like to ask patient to the, the surgery first sometimes if a patient to, uh, looks good, good health, and performance is very nice. Then the, I'd like to suggest them, particularly by customer aortic valve, the high risk of procedure complication. Then I like to suggest, I recommend the surgery first. I'd like the uh, same question, Dr. Lee Yung Chai. Actually, he is uh, the background is uh, the surgeon. So, in that case, is what is your recommendation? Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. In our hospital, 74 years old, and uh, the patient, as you mentioned, we would first ask for surgery. But if the patient and the surgeon met and had a discussion, and it had very high risk, so the surgeon may may not do the surgery, then we will do Tavi. Okay, great. I'm mean, sorry to keep you so so long up here. <laughs> Problem. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, our next lecture is uh, to be given by Simon Lam. He's going to talk about cerebral embolic protection in TAVA from rationale, practical viewpoint, and data updates uh, uh, from Queen Mary Hospital in Hong Kong. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So we know this topic is um, difficult to make a conclusion because it's still uh, people waiting for data or you may be a believer or you are not you want to be skeptic to wait for data but the problem is we are doing tavi every day and we have to make some compromise or decision making at this time because we really don't know what the data coming out for conclusion or for example five years ahead what will happen but we are now facing a lot of patients we want to protect them from stroke so we have to make a very um, reasonable 
or um, make decision making at this time. So just a kind of overview of what actually we have and the rationale behind and what problems or what clinical scenarios we encounter in our daily practice. So we know stroke is something that is still there for TAVI, for example, for mortality, for um, um, vascular um, complication, uh, bleeding complications, they all go down. But for um, stroke and also pacemaker, actually there's some improvement, but it's still something that we could do better. So we know uh, the Sentinel device is something FDA approved um, since 2017 and is easy to put in. Um, a filter, put in a uh, proximal filter at the basal cephalic trunk and another uh, filter in the left common carotid artery. So we know uh, it is helpful, but it's still not 100% protective because we are leaving some branches not protected. But this is something that we could do and is kind of approved it by authority. And we know um, from studies that we could capture something um, from the basket when you're doing the TAVI, for example, which is a case, uh, Savi in a trifecta is 19 and putting in 20. We do post dilatation to do modification, as we mentioned, and we do capture some kind of whitish or um, reddish materials. And this is a patient with a severe aortic stenosis with a lot of calcifications, and we could capture some calcified nodules. Um, although we don't do a lot of um, manipulations, uh, we capture, but uh, we do pre dilatation, post dilatation, and maybe there's a reason we capture something. And this patient, 94 year old, with a sapient direct implant with post dilatation, a tiny dot of white tissue material is likely to be calcium being captured. We don't know what they would do when they go up to the brain, but it's always good to capture them before they, they run away. So this is a patient with rheumatic um, aortic stenosis, and in our localities, are quite a large number of patients with rheumatic AS, and sometimes we capture some very fibrotic or materials look like this in our basket. And this is a patient, uh, looks like the, the case that uh, in the morning uh, with a mechanical prosthesis is also uh, rheumatic in nature. So we capture something strand-like, uh, very thin fibrous tissue um, after the procedure. So this is an extreme case, it's not commonly seen, but uh, this patient is a type 0 biker speed. We, an we anticipate uh, manipulations, pre-dilatation, pre-dilatation, and uh, the procedure went well and we capture a lot of things and luckily this patient doesn't end up with a stroke. So we feel good, but we don't know it's evidence-based, but uh, I think it, we feel good after that. So we have the Sentinel ID trial, we know about uh, Debris was captured in 99% of TAVI patients, no matter the size and what kind of materials, but we did capture things from the basket after the TAVI. Um, we know from imaging study that when you do uh, put in um, you know, a Sentinel, uh, the number of uh, lesions that pick up in AMR would decrease. The volume of lesions would decrease. Whether they would translate into clinical stroke is another story, but we, don't, we know it prevents something from going to the brain. So combining the data showing that in terms of um, the lesion volume of MRI, it, 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 could, it helps. Um, for stroke reduction, we don't have, a, we're waiting for those large scale randomized control trial, but across different scales of registries, small clinical trials, uh, registries, and it shows um, Sentinel provides 60% at, at least stroke rate reduction. And in low risk group, it, low or intermediate group, it also works similarly and um, a slightly better, um, slightly less um, particles when you do pre, uh, without pre or post dilatation, but it doesn't come to a conclusion, but at least it, it helps. Uh, to capture debris. And uh, people trying to gather more data, more patients in terms of meta-analysis, and it's one uh, large uh, meta-analysis showing that um, it's in favor of putting a CEP, but it's not conclusive. So we have the protected uh, TAVA study, which is very important. It includes 3,000 patients, uh, randomized one-to-one -one with TAVA without Sentinel and TAVA with Sentinel. And it's uh, very uh, strictly um, assessed in terms of neurologically, uh, neurologically whether they were clinical stroke. And the primary endpoint is 72 hour um, or discharge uh, stroke event, who, whichever comes earlier. And it's been published in the New England Journal of Medicine 2020. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't come up on the conclusion. But assessing the primary endpoint, um, it cannot show that there's definitely a reduction in stroke. Um, uh, you, numerically, it, it decreased, but it doesn't uh, make the conclusion. Um, it's not power, uh, it doesn't uh, reach the endpoints that it, it desirable to be reached. And across different subgroups, for example, a uh, degree of calcium, whether you do is a valve-in-valve procedure, post citation, how many manipulation you had, 
and whether uh, the degree of aortic calcification that we think sometimes maybe this patient we selected uh, maybe more benefit it doesn't show um, as such it doesn't um, have a large um, conclusion showing that which specific subgroup of patients would be benefit from the sentinel but it did show something that it is for disabling stroke in terms of numbers so for patients who put in a cerebral protection device eight out of uh, 1500 had had a stroke which is disabling, which is 0.5%. Compare of the control group without Sentinel is around 1.3%. It's 20 out of 1,500. But the number need to treat is 125. But this study is not powerful enough to, to make this conclusion, but this is observed in the study. So that in conclusion, in this study, it doesn't show a significant effect on the incidence, a reduction in incidence of stroke, but um, cannot rule out um, um, a, a benefit of CEP during TAVR. So this, we wait for another study, which is the British Heart Foundation Protect TAVR, involve more patients, randomized one into one um, manner, um, around 3,800 3, on both sides, and also with similar primary outcome to access. And more importantly to, is to wait for to putting these two large scale study together, the protected TAVR study and also um, the BHF protect TAVR study, make up to 10,000 patients um, a cohort, and we can really study uh, very in detail um, uh, whether this, this protection effect uh, is, is genuine or not. So this is another case in patients that we, because we do, ex, uh, in, uh, all the patients undergoing TAVI for, because we don't know the answer. In our center, we do every patient with TAVI, but we do uh, encounter this kind of very strange anatomy. This is a patient with at arteria lusoria, in which the right subcavian artery is goes to um, the very end. So it is separate origin, um, like for chimney. So sentinel would not work. But uh, you can see if you put in a sentinel from the break, uh, radial artery, it will come all a long way to the end, in the, in the descending, near the descending artery part. And you can make a loop to put it under the basket. But what you're protecting is the right common carotid and the right subcavian artery. So, uh, so we still do that because we don't have other device at that time. So we protect, uh, first of all, the subcavian artery. It doesn't make sense for stroke protection, but we protect the arm anyway, anyhow. But then we put in, a, make a U-turn to protect um, the right, uh, the left, uh, the right common carotid artery, and uh, like this. So we protect this too, but leaving the left common carotid artery not protected. And sometimes we encounter patients with very calcified disease at the ostium, very torturous artery. For those patients, we don't struggle to put in the a sentinel because we don't want to create trauma. Although it's very safe, but you know, you have a point to, uh, then when, when you pass, it, you will cause injury. So we have another system in Hong Kong, the Trigard system. Uh, the drawback is you need a big access on the other side, which is 11 French equivalent. But what you do is just sh uh, show up this part and whatever the anatomy upstairs, it will protect the patient. And so you could do the TAVI in a, in a, in a usual way and uh, you can retrieve the basket afterwards. And, but have to make sure this filter, this large deflector, um, by definition, uh, really have a good attachment to the uh, outer curve of the aorta that could really cover or seal off um, the, the orifice of the carotid arteries uh, or the neck arteries. And this is how we retrieve. We have to retrieve the basket with care. You don't want to throw every, everything up um, away so that um, otherwise when you capture something, but it goes up to the street. But with this maneuver, it, it just pumps up, it, it will actually defeat the purpose. And you can see there's a deflector what we observe. So the concept is actually different. For Sentinel, it's a filter to capture things. But this is kind of deflector. Actually, clots bounce on it, it just come downstream. So it theoretically increases more distal embolization, but clinically it doesn't show that. But it's kind of different concept. It's kind of coming hand in hand. If you have difficulties putting in Sentinel, don't struggle. Either you don't do it or you try alternative ways. So overall, there are all those technical concerns. Uh, you have to ask your anesthetist to preserve the, the right radio, radio artery. You don't want to have meant PCR on that for repeatedly because there's the only way you could put it in Sentinel. Doing local anesthesia or uh, sedation TAVI, you have to remind, uh, you have to uh, uh, secure the arm, don't want to assess movements. So we know about potential limitation of the existing device. We have to ex explain to the patient that could still 
cost drop because it's not 100% protective, but it's something we could offer to increase the safety of the procedure. We're waiting for uh, data from um, BHF uh, Protect Tower and also combined analysis. But I think most importantly is to minimize thrombolic risk in the first place. You don't rely on the filter to as a safety net. You want to do the procedure properly um, to prevent stroke in the first place, um, to maximize the outcome and to ensure safety for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Great questions for um, Simon. Thank you for excellent uh, lecture and well summarized lecture. Uh, I I think that the uh, the when it comes to use of uh, cerebral protection devices, uh, uh, patient selection is very very important. Uh, as you you mentioned that. Uh, uh, the NNT number is 125, is too, 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 too high. So who develop uh, stroke during TAVA procedure, do you think? So for that patient, uh, you, you, you want uh, several protection devices. Yes, so um, I understand the question and thank you very much. Mm. Uh, I think in, in a scientific point of view, yes, it's, you need 125 patients put in a basket to prevent one stroke. But if you just come back, you have 1,000 uh, patients done, you have 10 strokes. For ex I mean, we have, for example, a few number. Even if one stroke, then you will never forget that because it's kind of disabling stroke. It's not those cognitive impairment. It's not that like mouth, like um, sensory loss. It's just disabling stroke. So I think... Uh, in a kind of sensory level, uh, like a uh, feeling level that I think is, is really justified. It's, it's especially now, we don't know the conclusion, but at least, at least it doesn't cause any harm, but it saved that particular patient. But in a scientific viewpoint, we really need more data for that. So we don't know the answer. I think uh, for me, if cost is not a big concern, then I will ask the patient. I will never ask the patient to choose because it's not fair to the patient. Even I don't know the answer, I don't ask the patient to, to choose. Uh, it's a typical topic, but what we could do is I, I would say I would do for all patients, but in case we have difficult anatomy, well, I don't struggle because no one will accuse you for negligence, not putting the device. We don't know the data is not that compulsory yet. Um, but I would not bring my colleague not for not putting the device in because it's really reasonable because it's reasonable for an evidence-based era to know more uh, of the data before practicing a, the, the, um, in a, for incorporating that into the procedure. So it's a difficult topic. I don't know the answer, but I think it's a, it's a good opening for everyone for the discussion. Some data show, suggests that uh, uh, extremely uh, high uh, calcium score above 1,500 for example, and T finding shows a uh, uh, movable oscillating material ascending aura and the archi or valvular plate is absolutely risk for stroke predictor. For patient with uh, that kinds of finding should be done with uh, uh, cerebral protection. Some some intervention is to, uh, suggested that. Yes, so uh, yeah. I would for that suggestion would be more calcium, more manipulation, bike speed, history of stroke, all those things. But it's not shown in the protect tower study. Although the num they may, you may argue the intrinsic design of the study, uh, but I do have patients before without those high risk fissures, but end up with a stroke. Although the stroke could be multifactorial, but uh, it's difficult to make a judgment. I, I would save all our patients before I know the true answer. So, so Simon, do you in your own practice do you use uh, cerebral protection device in every patient? Every, unless it's a TR, uh, AR patient, we put T, J, R, uh, for AS patient, we put exclusive for our patients. And sometimes it's, it's kind of a joke because we, we make, cannot make a U-turn, for example, it's very torturous, but we try our best to put one basket. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not evidence-based, but at least we could do something and uh, just try for every patient. Mm -hmm. So, so I think anybody from Asan is, uh -huh. Asan's rate is 0.4% uh, in disabling stroke. Kind of hard to change that, I think. Yeah, I don't know how you're going to how many percent? patient you're going to study if you able to prove that. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, some uh, the, in the the disabling stroke is quite low. It's less than one percent. And so overall, the you know, uh, so and as you mentioned, the number of number needed to treat too much high. But the problem is the cost of uh, Sentinel is too much expensive. So in the, I think in the clinical trial mind, it, this uh, I think this is not applicable for most of. Uh, 
population. The, but however, I fully agree that Simon, you know, some patient, even the young patient, uh, experienced the disabling stroke. That was a, you know, lifetime disaster. That uh, I think the reason why we are concerned about, uh, you know, relative usefulness of the Sentinel device during the type of procedure. Dr. Bob, you have a mic. So uh, practically in the ASAN, what is uh, the percentage to use uh, the uh, cerebral protection device in everyday practice? What is the percentage? Yes. So and the now, yeah, nowadays we use the you know the investigational purpose, but uh, just remain the th a twenty set of the Sentinel. But it's a uh, if the we the finish the investigational plan. We are still concerning about the cost of benefit. Is a patient is a think about eighty year old. The overall cost uh, is not price, but the Sentinel price is more than thirty thousand uh, dollars. So that was very the expensive. But there was some, you know, concern about. So the ASAN is uh, the annually four hundred cases. Among that, what is the percentage of to use uh, cerebral protection? <laughs> Just the investment less than less than fifty is. A, the, now is a uh, investigation of purpose is in allowed it amounted. Okay, thank you very much, uh, you. Simon. I think we can conclude and uh, move on to the session number three. Thank you.